Welcome, welcome to the National Security College here at the Australian National University. Uh, I'm Rory Metcalf, the head of the National Security College, and I want to begin by um, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and paying respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. So today, uh, I think the, the, the scale of the presence in this room, including the media presence, really attests to the, uh, the significance and the timeliness of the, the speech you're about to hear and the, uh, the speaker that I'm very, very proud to introduce. Um, so Admiral Scott Swift uh, is here, uh, obviously, uh, as commander of US Pacific Fleet, but more than that, I think, is, is here as someone who has played a really significant role in deepening the strategic relationship, the alliance between Australia and the United States in our shared maritime region in the Indo-Pacific over many years. Uh, and uh, this goes back, of course, uh, not only to uh, a, uh, an appointment not so long ago as uh, commander of the Seventh Fleet, but uh, a very long and distinguished career uh, with far too much depth and detail for me to narrate here uh, in the service of, uh, of the United States uh, over, uh, over some decades. I think the timeliness of today's presentation about strategy, stability and the alliance in the Indo-Pacific is reinforced uh, by some of the news that we've been following lately. Of course, uh, there are questions in many minds in this country really about the, um, the nature, the character, the future, the strength of the alliance in an uncertain world, including in uh, times that have been politically uncertain. The, um, the news that some of us have followed this week about the, uh, the extra sets of eyes and ears on the Talisman Sabre exercise uh, that Admiral Swift has just joined us from, um, I think also has reinforced the view that the issues we discuss here today uh, are very real. Uh, they're not only something of, uh, of interest to my academic colleagues. And so uh, I guess in the spirit of what we do here at the National Security College, where we provide uh, executive training and development to Australian officials and uh, also to uh, officials from a range of, uh, of, of, uh, of partner countries, but also our academic program, but thirdly our role as a, I guess, a platform for quality debate about policy, about strategic and security issues that matter. It's my real pleasure uh, to welcome Admiral Scott Swift. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, good morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you uh, this morning. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be back. Uh, yeah, I think it was just uh, over a year and a half ago that I was here in this, uh, this same space uh, having a, a similar uh, dialogue, and it's great to see uh, so many uh, familiar faces uh, in the crowd. Uh, I think it says something about uh, the relationship uh, that the United States uh, enjoys with, uh, with Australia. Um, and one of those, as, as Roy mentioned, uh, going back to my Seventh Fleet days was, is Roy himself. Uh, as, a, as a young, new Seventh Fleet commander, uh, I came to uh, Australia at, at the invitation of, uh, of Roy and had uh, just a fantastic uh, engagement um, with broad-minded, uh, well-informed individuals that uh, expanded uh, my thinking on the challenges that we collectively uh, face here uh, in the region. And I very much look forward uh, to getting to that uh, same kind of dialogue in the, uh, the Q&A uh, period. I do want to thank the uh, National Security College uh, at the Australian uh, National University uh, for inviting, <laughs> inviting me back, uh, potentially some short-term memory loss there, and for providing us all the uh, opportunity to share our thinking and insights uh, with each other. I think that dialogue is critically important. And it's fora like this uh, that are critical, uh, a critical part uh, of our ongoing security dialogue, enabling a uh, more informed analysis of the challenges that impact Australia, the Indo-Asia Pacific region, and those uh, interests here, including the United States, those interests throughout the region. I look forward, as I mentioned, to your, uh, your questions and comments and uh, learning uh, from your thoughts, experiences, and insights. Uh, this is my fifth trip uh, to Australia, 
as the commander of uh, the U.S. Uh, Pacific Fleet. And uh, each visit, uh, I'm struck by the enduring bonds between uh, our navies, uh, our nations, uh, and our people. Uh, the crucible of uh, World War II forged that bond as our naval forces uh, fought together in places with names like Sunda Strait, Coral Sea, and Salvo Island, just to name a few. Our sailors share common character, common values, and in fact, common graves. Through the lens of shared adversity, we've developed an abiding confidence in each other's commitment, a mutual respect for each other's capabilities, and most importantly, an unshakable trust that comes from a natural byproduct of steadfast relationships. Make no mistake, our alliance today is ironclad. I find it encouraging to draw upon our history and to see how our relationship uh, continues to thrive today. For the last month, Australian American forces, as Rory alluded to, conducted the Talisman Sabre exercise, an exercise that included 33,000 personnel and 21 ships, including the aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan, her strike group, the USS Bonham Richard, and her expeditionary strike group, and the Australian New Zealand Amphibious Ready Group. Uh, I actually uh, just came from uh, participating myself, again, as Rory mentioned, as the uh, uh, command and control portion of the exercise in Brisbane. I was working alongside a U.S. Army Lieutenant General, a Royal Australian Navy Rear Admiral, a U.S. Air Force Major General, a Royal Australian Air Force Air Commodore, and a U.S. Marine Brigadier General. If Americans in Australia are two people separated by a common language, I can tell you that that language barrier does not exist between our militaries. While the exercise was both realistic and challenging, our combined joint forces displayed how smoothly we integrate and operate together. What struck me most is our ability to maneuver an impressive amount of combat power very quickly from sea to shore and around the operating area. That capability is critical and shows that we are ready to be where it matters, with when it matters, with what matters, within the region and indeed across the globe. With that in mind, multilateral exercises like Talisman Sabre help improve our ability to operate together, demonstrating the responsible use of combat power to provide security for the sake of stability to enable prosperity. In doing so, we set by example that the combined application of accepted norms, standards, rules, and laws is the best approach to counter forces of instability. Those forces of instability offer a false alternative, alternative focused on bilateral solutions for multilateral challenges, too often leveraging coercion and the use of force over discourse and dialogue. We never know where crisis may occur, but it is our job to be prepared to respond. It is not lost on me that our shared history highlights that Australia's defense force has been deployed globally for over a century, demonstrating a keen appreciation for how frictions originating well beyond our own shores can impinge on security conditions at home. That's a valuable perspective to have, especially in maritime, uh, with maritime nations, and it helps widen the scope of things for us to consider when dealing with national, regional, and global security issues. One of the most pressing maritime security challenges facing us in the Indo-Asia Pacific, in my mind, <coughs> is the potential erosion of a rules-based international system. It is a system that emerged from the ashes of World War II, generated unprecedented levels of prosperity, lifted millions out of poverty, and benefited so many nations over the past 70 years. Yet its continued acceptance is being challenged on several fronts by the very nations it most benefited. As U.S. Defense Secretary Mattis stated at the Shangri-La Dialogue last month, quote, the international order is not imposed on individual nations. 
Rather, the order is based on principles that were embraced by nations trying to create a better world and restore hope to all." End quote. Membership is not based on size, strength, or wealth. All nations, large and small, have an opportunity to participate and reap the collective rewards of cooperation. Unfortunately, some choose to reject the accepted framework of norms, standards, rules, and laws that underpin the international system and the inclusive security network supporting it and instead pursue a more self-serving path. We have no clear example of the consequences of self-isolation and a desire to return to an earlier period where might makes right than that of North Korea. Satellite imagery underscores the contrast between a darkened North Korea and the bright lights of its prosperous neighbors. It's a stark comparison, but it emphasizes the positive impact of being a part of that rules-based international system. It is difficult for me to understand those that support such an approach from a national, regional, and certainly global construct. Behavior of other nations seems to suggest that opportunistic approach that seeks to impose national laws in international space is not a model to embrace. In the South China Sea, for example, rather than use the mechanisms in place for resolving disputes or advancing national claims, there is an emerging alternative to the global order being offered that leverages national power to coerce neighbors to the reluctant acceptance of unilateral actions. Smaller nations facing a growing preponderance of military and paramilitary force just beyond their shores have little recourse but to acquiesce within such a system. The principle of unfettered access to the global commons at the heart of freedom of navigation discussions cuts across domains and disciplines as our maritime economies become increasingly intertwined. The concern of many in the region is that the, imposed, the imposition of restrictive national laws in international waters reflects parallel efforts to restrict access to diplomatic, information, military, and economic domains as well. This is why the role of navies is important beyond just the maritime. For decades, the U.S. Navy and our allies in the Royal Australian Navy have, through global practice and observance of the international norms, standards, rules, and laws, reinforced the value of this critical principle. U.S. forces will continue to fly, sail, and operate wherever international laws allow, and we remain committed to protecting the rights, freedoms, and lawful uses of the sea and airspace guaranteed to all countries. In a region dominated by the maritime environment, upholding the rules-based system, an inclusive security network requires a constant reaffirmation by Indo-Asia Pacific nations and their naval forces. As a rule, when nations apply sea power professionally and, responsibil and responsibly, it broadens national and regional prosperity alike. When sea power is applied uh, pro uh, provocatively and opportunistically, friction results with great potential for spiraling, spiraling instability. The region of the Indo-Asia Pacific has enjoyed great prosperity since the end of World War II, and potential for continued and increasing pro prosperity yet remains. There is no doubt that nations who have embraced the international rules-based system have shared in that prosperity and will continue to do so. And there is also no doubt that navies that uphold the international rules-based system, like the U.S. Navy and the Royal Australian Navy continue to do, they will re there will remain essential uh, to ensuring the security and stability that enables that prosperity. And with that, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Please, uh, please don't go away, Admiral. I think uh, there's going to be 
a lot of interest generated, a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to, I guess, uh, take advantage of the prerogative of hosting the event to perhaps pose the first question to you, but then invite some <coughs> more comments and questions from the audience. If you have a question, uh, please do get my attention and um, indicate who you are uh, when a microphone comes to you, because we are on the record. Brett Admiral, I think your, your remarks uh, really encapsulated the, both the challenge and, I think, ways forward um, on a lot of the, uh, the regional security issues that worry us. Those of us who've observed the, uh, I guess, the uh, Talisman Sabre exercise from afar this year um, have been struck, I'll be very direct about it, by the fact that um, China's taken some interest in the exercise on this occasion and there have been, uh, I think, some pretty credible press reports about the, um, the presence of a Chinese surveillance vessel uh, in Australia's EEZ, presumably not there to, uh, to monitor yacht racing. Um, I'm curious to know what your perspective is on that, um, w whether you can make <coughs> some sort of comment, not only on that particular instance, but on the principle, if you like, that's, um, that's at stake here. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for that, Maureen. The, um, let, me, uh, let me change the context of, of the question, if I might uh, have that liberty, and, uh, and take you back to uh, uh, RIMPAC, uh, not the most recent RIMPAC, but the uh, RIMPAC before, uh, where we had a, a similar uh, situation um, with a, uh, a Chinese intelligence ship that was uh, participating uh, in the exercise, though, in a, a somewhat uncoordinated manner. Um, the, uh, so I, I think, in a, in, in poor, and far be it from me to comment on something that is, is clearly uh, an Australian uh, governmental issue, so I'm going to put the perspective in another context and take it back to my comments that uh, as we look at challenges uh, across the region, we should uh, focus on them uh, not so much as challenges but as opportunities. So I, I view this as a, as a great opportunity, the experience that we had in, in RIMPAC. So I apologize, I am, I am not an expert on uh, uh, UNCLOS and uh, uh, the uh, United uh, Nations Law, the C uh, document, um, but I am a student of it. And uh, UNCLOS uh, would uh, suggest that in the RIMPAC uh, perspective that these acti activities not only were uh, entirely, entirely legal, but well within the prerogative of, uh, of any, any nation. Uh, those operations were being conducted in the United States EEZ. Um, there are some expectations of those operations. Uh, my approach would be to ask the question of any foreign vessel operating in the United States uh, EEZ is to ensure that those operations are military operations and not commercial operations. Because if there's commercial operations, there's a law enforcement factor that comes into play, and I would expect that the United States Coast Guard would visit that vessel uh, to ensure that whatever commercial activities were taken uh, were in compliance with, uh, with international law. But safe to say on, on the RIMPAC example that, that we made the assumption that it was, uh, that it was military uh, based uh, operations and uh, collections. Um, the opportunity that uh, creates is to uh, increase the insights, increase the understanding of uh, what's behind the action. And uh, as I continue to uh, interact with my Chinese colleagues, uh, I've met uh, several occasions with the uh, South Sea Fleet commanders, the East Sea Fleet commanders, uh, the North Sea Fleet commander. I've met with the previous uh, chief of uh, uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy, and had met just recently uh, with uh, with the new chief. Although we had known uh, each other in, in his uh, his previous roles, so it's an opportunity to engage in a in a dialogue um, directly with the Chinese to help understand the dichotomy in my mind is why is there a different rule set applied with respect to taking advantage of UNCLOS and other EEZs but there's this perspective that there's a different rule set uh, that applies within another nation's EEZ. It goes back to the rules-based order and an understanding of what that rules-based order and that understand that those <coughs> rules apply broadly and regionally. It's, it's how you gain consensus and in, in where countries uh, um, have different perspectives. So again, I look at it as an opportunity to engage and, and better understand uh, the broader challenges and the perspective of those challenges um, from the various stakeholders within the region. 
Thank you for that. We'll take some questions from the floor. I know we've got um, media present as well as um, uh, the, the, the interested public, so I'll try and spread the questions out a little. But I'll start with the, uh, the gentleman in the middle of the back row. Please identify, wait, wait for the microphone and identify yourself. Good morning, sir. Uh, Major Jared Thompson, Army Headquarters. I've seen a lot of um, commentary um, talking about uh, referencing the, uh, the, in the context of a, of a rising global power, the uh, Thucydides trap. And, um, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of whether that example of the um, Peloponnesian War uh, a couple of thousand years ago still holds any relevance today or whether people are probably reading too much into it. Uh, yes. Uh, ne next question. Uh, well, you, you, you are at a national security college, so it's the perfect, it's the perfect question. The, uh, so I think there's great value in uh, uh, using history as a guide uh, to expanding the dialogue uh, with respect to the challenges that, uh, that we face. Um, I do think it's important that um, we bookmark uh, that discussion as originate, originating from uh, a historical perspective. Uh, there's, there's a danger in there as well, so you can see where I'm going with the answer, and you alluded to it, uh, that history is not a template uh, by which to judge uh, what's happening today, because the situation today is very different. I mean, I, I could spend 10 minutes talking about why it's so different. I mean, in my mind, it starts with social media, uh, the speed of information. Uh, the, the global economy uh, that, that has uh, second, third, fourth, fifth, six orders of effect of a decision made that it's very difficult for the decision maker to fully understand what those impacts are going to be uh, over time. So I think the world that we live in, um, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps overstated and stating the obvious, is much more uh, complicated today than then. But having said that, it, it goes to a common theme that I reinforce to my staff, is that um, it's so easy to judge because it's so hard to understand. And we need to broaden that dialogue to, to understand. Um, that as uh, most people that ask me a, a question along this theme, it comes to uh, how do you make space, uh, how do you accommodate uh, the changes in uh, whatever the, the uh, power centers are in, uh, in any period. I mean, if you go back to the, the, uh, uh, the, the city's trap that you speak of, it was really a, 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 a focus in my mind about the accommodations of, of uh, uh, centers of power as they changed. And that, that is absolutely applicable today. Uh, a common uh, a reference that I use is uh, the global stage isn't getting any bigger. Um, it is what it is. So the question is, as powers rise and fall on that stage and, and new powers step onto that, that stage, how do we accommodate uh, their positions on that stage? Because room has to be made. And I think everyone would agree, uh, using China as the example, um, they are a global power, certainly from an economic uh, perspective. And I would suggest uh, we all would want to make space for them on that stage. The question is, what's the mechanism by which that space is created? Is, is it that standard of, of uh, uh, those international norms and standards that have, have governed that change in power? I mean, their, their origin was, was really at the end of World War II. And look at the approach that uh, Japan took prior to that. And I think certainly the, the US took a leadership role in establishing what those rules were at various conferences. It was a San Francisco conference in, in uh, 1954 uh, that, that uh, worked through the process of establishing those rules here in the Pacific. But equally important is we established the institution for changing those rules, because those that were at that conference had the forethought to understand that the rules base that they were setting then may not be applied in the future. Um, so it's equally important to focus on those, uh, those institutions. And regardless of what your historical uh, perspective is and what you may apply to better understand the challenges that we face today, um, that dialogue is critically important. 
but part of that dialogue needs to be focused on the mechanisms by which those ideas uh, flow into that, into that domain. And I think we've established uh, institutions that are well suited to, to generate and support that dialogue. Uh, my concern is that um, one is the, the rules-based approach is being challenged for an alternative. Uh, my question would be to fix what? And then the challenges to the institutions themselves is uh, something that um, there should be a broader discussion on, I think. Thank you. We'll take, uh, we'll take some more questions. Um, the uh, gentleman in the middle. <coughs> Thank you, Admiral, for coming to talk to us, especially at this time. In addition oh, to sorry, the, please identify you, yourself. Uh, I'm Pete Van Ness. I'm uh, a visiting fellow in international relations. <coughs> in addition to the structural situation of the so-called Thucydides trap, since the election of Donald Trump, uh, it's true that we live in extraordinary times. And uh, at risk of being blunt, I would like to pose this question to you. If, when you return to your command next week, you were to receive an order from the Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States, to make a nuclear attack on China, would you do it? <laughs> so far, these are yes and no answers. <laughs> The answer would be yes. So every uh, member of the U.S. military has sworn an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to obey the officers and the President uh, of the United States as the Commander-in-Chief appointed over us. Uh, so this is, uh, this is core to uh, the American, uh, American democracy. And any time you have a military that is moving away from a focus and a, an allegiance to civilian control, uh, then we, we really have uh, significant uh, problems. Thank you. That, that's an answer that, of course, worries us. Right. And may I do one follow-up, and okay. that is... We'll take question rather than comment. Thank is, you. Is, is, this quest, is this question one that is being discussed among military leaders in the United States at your level of command? So I really think it's a different question. The question is, what is the appropriate application of military power? And we live in a United States, I'm speaking as an American, we live in a democracy. And that uh, discussion is a robust discussion that uh, started I, when I first became aware of it and continues uh, today. Um, I, I referred to it in, uh, in my, com my prepared comments and that is the application of, of military power, which is core uh, to, I think, to what your, your question is. But there's opportunity, uh, this is an example of, of what Rory has, has uh, teed up here. There's an opportunity to have this type of broad uh, discussion with uh, individuals of alternative views of, of other individuals to generate that, that dialogue. Thanks for the question. We've got a couple over here in this corner. We'll start with, I think it's uh, David Rowe and then the gentleman in front of him. Thanks, Rory. David Rowe from the Sydney Morning Herald and Age Newspapers Admiral. I know we're having a media roundtable in a couple of hours from now, so I risk of making you sick of the sight of me before we uh, even start that. But um, I'm over eager for you just to unpack a phrase that you used in your speech. You said, uh, in a region dominated by the maritime environment, upholding the rules-based order and inclusive security network requires constant reaffirmation by Indo-Asia Pacific nations and their naval forces. Can you define constant reaffirmation and um, what it would look like from Australia's point of view in particular? Uh, well, I won't, uh, and I'll go back to the previous uh, question. Um, the, the most important thing that I do as the Pacific Fleet Commander is build relationships. The most important byproduct of that relationship is trust. It's also the most perishable element of any relationship. So if you're not constantly building trust, there's always this sense of, is the commitment still there from, from an individual perspective? I think that's uh, some of the challenges from, uh, that were, were brought out in the, uh, in the previous question. So it's that, that it is very important, and this is beyond the scope of any one country, it's very important that uh, we continue to act and understand the value that's been brought by this, this rules-based system. 
Because we, if we take it for granted, then we're in peril of headed down another path and end up in a place <coughs> where our ability to take, um, from a military perspective, my specialty is, is security. But security for security's sake has little value. It's transitioning that security into stability. And that occurs through actions. And that actions is governed by that international rules-based order. So if people are concerned about how military power may be used. That's why it's so important that we continue to demonstrate that from a national perspective in an international construct. I would suggest here in the Pacific, mine is more of a regional construct, so that we can show that connection between security and stability. And then it's up over to the whole of government. So when I talked about the importance of freedom of navigation, uh, not just from a naval perspective, from, a, from the diplomatic information, granted naval is a part of military and economic, that, that's the dime construct. It needs to be across all of those domains. And the challenges in one domain need to be thought of in the context of uh, uh, what similar challenges bring in the other domains as well. So that's the security to stability piece. It's that connection between dime that connects the stability for, to prosperity. Because if nothing is done with stability, if you don't act on those opportunities, prosperity is not, not going to follow on. So it's a whole of government uh, approach in my mind. It's not just the, the military piece. And that's what I meant with everyone has an opportunity, not, here, not just here in the region, but broadly. And, and too often times, I can't go anywhere without having a China-centric discussion. This is not a China-centric discussion. I mean, look at Europe and the challenges being faced in, in Europe with uh, you know, this recent discussion of uh, a Chinese-Russian uh, bilateral exercise in the Black Sea. In my mind, entirely appropriate, well within the bounds of, of uh, international rules. Uh, look at, um, you talk about the U.S. Uh, election, uh, look at Brexit, look at uh, other elections around the world. We are in a, if, if I had had this discussion a year ago and someone were to ask me, I'm glad I didn't get asked this question, Tell us where you think we'll be a year from now. I would have been so off the mark, so please don't ask that question. <laughs> but we're going to, it's what's more important are what are the activities that take us to that destination that we all want to arrive at collectively? What are those actions that are required? Part of those actions are the reaffirmation of that rules based order that has brought such great prosperity to the Indo Asia Pacific. Take uh, this question here, and then I think I saw uh, at the back of the room. Yes, please. Uh, Richard Salmons from the Department of International Relations here. Thanks, Admiral, for coming to this public forum. I was wondering if I could ask almost a semi-personal question, as I was very interested to read your biography, and I saw that you served in Operation Praying Mantis, which was the one in 1998 when, in response to an Iranian provocation, the United States retaliated against Iranian oil platforms, and indeed hit the Iranian naval forces quite hard. But perhaps most importantly, as soon as the point was made, U.S. forces were able to pull back and avoid any further escalation. I just wondered, this must have been a very formative experience in your naval career. And I wonder if when you think about situations, say provocations in Iran or North Korea, would such an operation be plausible today? Or would the risk of escalation just be too high? Yeah, um, so it's a great question. I go back to the first question. It's always, um, you put yourself at risk if you take a data point and try to extrapolate from that one data point uh, what the destination is that you're arriving, uh, that you want to arrive at, and even the path that you'll take to get there. It's important that multiple data points uh, be tied together. Um, I, I thought where you were going to go with the question was how old I am. <laughs> but. Uh, <coughs> We, the United States, I mentioned that, that Australia uh, armed forces have been deployed globally for over a century now. Um, uh, from a United States uh, perspective, um, I have been involved uh, directly in, in uh, combat operations since I was a, a young lieutenant commander. Prang Manis was that, that, first, uh, that first experience. So I think it's important that we bring a collective perspective to the challenges that we face in the region. And to go back in history and suggest that worked so well, and I, I, I'm not saying that it did, it, over to the diplomats and, and, uh, and uh, leaders in government to make that assessment, perhaps historians. Um, but it, it, it is difficult, uh, if the assumption was that worked so well, to, to lift that whole cloth as a template 
and try to apply it someplace else because the dynamics invariably are, are very, very different. I will say that it was a, a formative uh, uh, event uh, for me. Um, it, was, it was the beginning of my thinking uh, with respect to uh, the use of, of military power um, and the fact that military power should be used as an enabler to regain a, a condition of stability uh, by which dialogue and diplomacy can take root. And I, and I think that's what happened in that military operations. Issues had accelerated to the point that there was a sense that it was unable to have a dialogue otherwise, that the forces of instability, uh, certainly in the, in the, in the region, uh, needed to be reduced. Uh, I would argue that um, it was a measured approach. Uh, the oil rigs uh, were, were attacked for strategic reasons. Those two ships that were attacked for strategic reasons, but no other naval forces were attacked for strategic reasons to not do that. I think that's the approach that needs to be taken, this broader approach, which is why I so much value coming to forums like this. If I only talk to my, my military uh, colleagues, then we're going to come up with military solutions. We need to expand across that whole dime, the diplomacy, the information, the military, and the economic, to understand what tools are available to change the conditions that we find nationally and internationally unacceptable. Thank you. We'll take a question over here, I think, from my, one of our PhD students. Um, Andrea Serrano, a PhD candidate from National Security College. Um, my question is a little bit more localized for Australia, but I would like to know the American perspective on it. Um, in the negotiations uh, for the establishing of the maritime border with Timor-Leste, what would be the ideal scenario for America um, that, the, the, that uh, would make the, stabilize the, that region? The, um, uh, you're, uh, so I'm really not qualified uh, to speak specifically about that issue. Uh, but I, what I will say is we, it goes back to the comment that I made about the second, third, fourth, fifth order of uh, uh, consequences of a decision being made. And too often times when we make a decision, it's based on a first order analysis and not that broader, deeper analysis. That's why I think institutions like this are so important, that there's this collective collection of uh, individuals with uh, disparate and differing views that come together uh, to focus on collective challenges. And so uh, you mentioned one. Uh, I, I'll go back to another point that I, I think I mentioned. I've, it's been a very rich engagement over the last two days here in, in Canberra, and I, I find myself uh, repeating myself, sometimes in the same event, uh, which is, uh, doesn't instill a sense of confidence in others that I'm speaking to. Uh, so I hope I'm not repeating myself here. I think I did mention the importance of relationship building, and that's uh, what I do. So I've been to uh, timor Leste uh, on several occasions for that very reason, to make sure that I have a better understanding broadly of what's going on in the region. And I know that's, that's, there are tensions that are related there um, that, that's, that certainly surround the, the local area. There, there's certainly Indonesian, Malaysian, Philippine, Australian, Timor-Leste obviously uh, being there. So visiting all those countries and, and having the dialogue about those issues that some may feel are too sensitive. That's not what the first visit's for. The first visit is to understand, is to, is to de develop an understanding of the individuals that you're dealing with. The second visit is about, let's get to those consequential issues to have that discussion. So that the toolbox that we're reaching into is a toolbox that's rich with opportunities. It's not just a military toolbox. It's a toolbox with those those diplomatic, those information, those military, and those economic uh, tools that are that are made available to resolve challenges such as the, the border issues that, that you raise. Thanks. We'll take uh, we'll take one or two more. I'll um, have one question for the end if uh, if uh, if I have time. But I think uh, gentleman right in the back row. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Yuhua Jian, a PhD student from school CHL. I would like to ask a much more technical question because as we have heard, so many Chinese scholars and generals lay claim that the PLA is capable of using DF-21 missiles to take down U.S. aircraft carrier. So do you think they are capable of doing so? Absolutely. Yeah, so is Australia. 
<laughs> so it, the, we need the, the, it, it is a technical question. But, but it's, not, it's not a productive approach to, to having a broader uh, dialogue. Any country, uh, I think a country's military should match uh, its, its broader national power. And oftentimes that national power I categorize into two primary orders, uh, areas. One is uh, its ability to influence the region or influence the world. That's the <coughs> diplomatic side of it. And the other side is the economic side. And I think it's reflective of, of the scope scale of uh, the, the military here in Australia. So Australia has fulfilled a significant leadership role, not just in, in the region of, of uh, Australia, but broadly, uh, really around, uh, around the world. Uh, and I think they have a military uh, that matches that as well. Now, when you, when you have a military, we do uh, focus on the technical and tactical eaches. Um, and I, I certainly have great respect uh, for the, the PLA. Um, I know the PLAN better, uh, so maybe I have more respect for the PLAN. That's why I spend so much time talking to the leaders of the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy. Um, I think that mill-to-mill -mill engagement is richer than it's ever been in my uh, military career. And I think having those dialogues is more important than getting into the tactical leeches of, of the capability of the navies. The issue is, how are you going to use that power for the benefit of the region? You know, the power to increase stability and from stability to prosperity. Thanks. We can take another question from the group. You seem to be... Uh to be flagging here, but I think we have a question here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Teresa Kubokova. I'm from the Department of International Relations, and I'd like to ask whether there's any um, interactions between the actual navies when you, I don't know, broken the ports, or if there's interactions with the Chinese, and whether that perhaps leads to agreements or some sort of bottom-up um, approach, kind of water building. Yeah. I, I I hadn't thought about it in that context, but um, it probably has led to the agreements that the uh, 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 code for unalert unalerted encounters at sea um, is a uh, uh, began as a I want to say a bilateral, but it was a focused effort between the U.S. Navy and the, the PLAN, um, and then it's it's much broader than that now. I mean, it's it's it really is is uh, a uh, a uh, model uh, that we use to uh, bridge the communication gap that's created um, based on differences in language uh, that really all navies in the region have embraced and I suspect uh, come back three years from now that it will have spread uh, globally because the utility of it uh, has such great value and I think that utility the discussion initially at the higher levels was about the policy implications but the utility of it was never a question I think that came from uh, the engagements that we have at the tactical level. I can tell you that, uh, that my interactions uh, with, uh, uh, from commander to commander, counterparts that meet each other at sea, it's somewhat unique from a uh, naval perspective. We're all sailors regardless of uh, what flag uh, flies from the fantail or what nation uh, we swear uh, allegiance to. Um, the sea is a uh, daunting environment uh, to operate in. Uh, the, uh, it's unforgiving, and there, there is a, uh, an embrace code across all sailors that uh, all sailors will respond to sailors in distress. And that generates uh, a, a natural affinity for dialogue uh, when we encounter uh, one each other, uh, with each other at sea. My discussion with uh, the uh, South China Sea Fleet, the East China Sea Fleet, the North Sea Fleet Commander, the Chief of uh, uh, Chinese Navy is very, very positive. We talk very frankly about consequential issues that uh, our nations face together and what its implications are in the, in the maritime uh, environment. And I do think that the underpinning of those discussions is the relationship that happens on an everyday basis. Uh, the Pacific Fleet will have conducted over uh, a thousand ship days of operations just in the South China Sea. Um, we conducted uh, operations in the South China Sea with eight other nations just in the month of uh, June. 
so this is a this is a uh, a common area which we can come together to generate that dialogue. It doesn't need to be just in a forum like this. Uh, it can be on the sea, and I'm and I'm happy to characterize uh, as uh, that's exactly what uh, what has happened. It's um, Admiral. It seems to be exercise season at the moment, uh, not just with Talisman Saber, of course, or as you as you note, the uh, the Russians and Chinese in some uh, far flung places, but uh, but also <coughs> the, uh, the Malabar exercise was conducted recently. Uh, United States, India, and Japan. And of course, some voices in, in Australia have been interested in perhaps in future Australia playing a role there. It'd be interesting to hear a little bit more from you on what you see as you know, very, I guess, very candidly, uh, purposes of exercises like this. Perhaps using Malabar as an example, if you like, um, uh, both in a both in a capability sense, but also in a political sense. Yeah. Uh, actually, that last uh, the characterization uh, that you had is uh, insightful, and I think it captures well uh, the, what the focus is with respect to uh, uh, with respect to exercise. There's always a capability piece. Um, there's a uh, there's a readiness uh, piece that uh, is uh, is important as well, and there's a national piece uh, to those exercises. And I think uh, Malabar, which we have just uh, completed, uh, is a great example. Um, for those of you that may not be uh, fully informed, there's actually two versions of Malabar. There's a Malabar uh, that we exercise in the vicinity of, uh, of India, and the next year uh, we conduct Malabar in the vicinity of, uh, of Japan. Uh, Malabar is a bilateral exercise still today between uh, India and the United States, uh, specifically uh, from a, a naval perspective with, uh, with Seventh Fleet. Um, and uh, we have uh, included uh, the Japanese in, uh, in the years that it is uh, around India. That is, a, that is a new development, but it's still a bilateral uh, exercise with multilateral, certainly trilateral or lateral overtones to it. Uh, and then when we've exercised uh, Malabar around Japan, we've always included uh, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force in those uh, in those. Uh, in that uh, piece of the exercise series. Um, there is an interest in, uh, in Australia participating. I know that dialogue is uh, ongoing. I'm a great supporter of Australians' uh, participation, uh, certainly in the, uh, the, the uh, element of the exercise that occurs in the Indian Ocean. Um, uh, Australia clearly has, uh, has interest there uh, as well. But more important, it is uh, the focus on uh, multilateral engagements. So this idea of taking a bilateral approach to solving problems, uh, I, I find it hard to uh, find a problem that's truly uh, bilateral in nature, certainly in the maritime. There's almost always a multilateral uh, element to it. And if you expand the discussion out to a global perspective, um, the parallels that we see here in the Indo-Asia Pacific are, are clear and sharp with respect to uh, the challenges that are being faced elsewhere in the world. I mentioned uh, uh, Europe earlier, but it's certainly true in South America, and Africa, uh, other regions uh, of the world. So that multilateral element of exercising is something um, that I'm always striving uh, to encourage and, uh, and expand. Thank you, Admiral. We've got room for one or two more questions. Um, I might go to Matt Sussex, our academic director, if there are no others. Thanks very much, Admiral. Um, he doesn't to... need a microphone. No, no. <laughs> um, I'm tempted to ask where you think we'll be next year, but I won't. Um, uh, I'd like to bring you back a little bit to rules-based order. Um, and I, I think you had some quite thoughtful observations about people changing uh, their thinking to be more accommodating. My question, I guess, is, is there room in the rules-based order for the Belt and Road Initiative? Yeah. And what types of alterations in thinking do you think the major stakeholders might have to make? Yeah, so I, 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 there absolutely is. Uh, I think there's room in the rules-based order for any concept that any individual or nation uh, may uh, 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 support or, or may pro-offer. Uh, I think that the thing that's most important is that that brought that that those proposals be brought forward to that uh, uh, the, the stakeholders broadly, whether it's a regional issue or if it's a global issue, to have that discussion. 
so the the uh, the one belt one road initiative, uh, many in the region are uh, are embracing that, and I I think uh, uh, part of that uh, the reason for that is the dialogue that that China has been expanding to include others in the region <coughs> to help understand. Um, what is the plot? What's the impetus? What's the destination of the One Belt, One Road? Uh, what are the equities of those that would participate or choose not to participate in it? That, that's the level of dialogue uh, to get to. But it's not that, it, you know, I think one of the advantages is if there was a military approach that the One Belt, One Road initiative was being forced on people from a military perspective, I, I don't think uh, China would be nearly as successful as they have been um, with that approach compared to uh, the approach that they've, they've taken. Can I just add a quick adjunct to that, Admiral? How do you see the, um, the Chinese uh, security presence or military presence in Djibouti that gets reported now in the media uh, in, in, in light of China's uh, interest and in light of the interests of other countries in the region? So uh, I think that goes back to uh, uh, the broad point. I haven't used the word specifically, but it's transparency. So as I, I, I am, and I'll say gratefully, my good friend uh, Admiral Donegan would take exception to that. But um, you know, my my first flag tour was as uh, the uh, deputy commander of uh, Naval Forces Central Command, and, and since that tour, I, I've been in the Pacific since, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. I find the region, I find the challenges uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. It's so dynamic. I mean, just the example of going back a year and doing the the reversion analysis of of what is it that was missed that we couldn't do the predictive analysis uh, that, would, that would have uh, highlighted where we would end up today? I don't think it could be done because there are so many factors in play. Um, but as I do have friends uh, in the Middle East specific uh, to, that, uh, to that region, um, the question is to what end? But look, China has a global economy. Uh, they have significant economic interests in, in Africa. It doesn't surprise me that they would want a, uh, I don't want to mischaracterize this, I'm not an expert, China may not be characterizing that as a base. Uh, by using that term, I don't mean it in that, in that context, but certainly a place uh, to support their military operations from. It's a long way from China. It's, I would imagine it would be a logistics hub. It's the context in which that will be applied to it as we move forward in the future. I think that's, the, uh, that's where the dialogue drives to. And quite frankly, I don't think it's a military dialogue. It needs to be broadening across that whole of government approach. Those that, are, that have concerns from their perspective, bring it into that uh, international forum. Bring it into those institutions that have been established to support those kinds of dialogues, and then have the discussion. I'm going to end with a, um, I know we've got one or two hands up now, but we're going to have to wrap it up. I'm going to end with a yes no question because I know that you're, you're good at those, Admiral. Um, so we've had one question on nuclear issues today already, putting a pretty stark hypothetical, but I'm going to put a slightly different question, which is um, in two parts. Do you think uh, North Korea is serious about putting nuclear weapons on submarines? And if so, is it wasting its money? <laughs> um. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that one out of the context of North Korea. I think uh, the um, developing uh, a submarine capability um, is a is a double-edged sword. Uh, I think I, I would use Australia as the example. I We're think not putting nukes on ours, but we're no, <laughs> no, I'm just talking about the submarine capability to begin with. I'm going to get to the new question uh, in, in a minute. But I've got to give my friend uh, Tim Barrett. Um, incredible praise for the strategic approach that he has taken uh, to ensuring that the capability that Australia already had in Collins class and how to modernize that capability with an understanding of what the national interests are of Australia. Because ultimately that, that military power is used in the national interest of whatever country um, that military uh, uh, supports. Um, to the specific of, and I'll characterize it as uh, uh, submarine launch missiles, it, it is an uh, incredible technical challenge. Uh, and any country that, that goes down that path to try to develop that capability um, should do it uh, with a clear understanding uh, that it is as much art as it is science. You just can't take a slide rule 
uh, take uh, uh, physics experts, engineering experts, and develop that capability out of, uh, out of whole cloth. There's, there's a whole series of issues that, that come up. I'll go back to the question that was asked about uh, civilian control of uh, nuclear weapons. There needs to be very clear controls uh, with any nation uh, that uh, possesses nuclear weapons as to what those controls are. And I think most of the dialogue that occurs in that, in that nuclear realm, I'm certainly not an expert in it, uh, goes to that sense of uh, the veracity of those controls and the confidence of those that are adjacent uh, to those nations. Are they confident um, that that commitment to those controls is uh, in some ways? The, 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 uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Look, um, you've been, uh, Admiral, you've been very generous with your, your thoughts and your time today. I think you've, uh, certainly for me and I think for, for many of us in the room, you've reaffirmed the view uh, that not only do you, um, you bring a message of, um, of reassurance about, um, about the alliance and about the, the depth of the military relationship between Australia and the United States, but you also bring, bring great insights uh, as, a, as a military leader, as a security practitioner, but as a diplomat as well. And I think it's the, the diplomatic uh, side to really what we see uh, in your work that, um, that will stay with me for the rest of, um, the, rest of the day. I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues in the room to join me now in thanking you.